Get set for the Mole Mystery Theater. And details later on about Mole's big $25,000 contest, My Closest Shave. First prize, a $3,500 vacation trip. Other prizes, five new Ford Deluxe sedans, ten late model television sets, and many other big cash prizes. <laughs> Good evening. This is Jeffrey Barnes, welcoming you to the Mole Mystery Theater, the program that presents the best in mystery and detective fiction. Tonight's story by George and Gertrude Fass is entitled Solo Performance. Our stars, the very versatile Everett Sloan, stage, screen, and radio actor currently appearing with Rita Hayworth and Orson Welles in the motion picture Lady from Shanghai. Tonight, Mr. Sloan will play the part of Albert Perry, an actor who's forced by circumstances to play the most difficult role of his career, a role wherein his life depends upon his solo performance. But first, a short reminder, friends. The story of your closest shave, your narrowest escape from danger of any kind, may win a grand prize in Mole's $25,000 contest, My Closest Shave. Listen for full details later. This is Jeffrey Barnes again, and act one of tonight's Mole Mystery solo performance, starring Everett Sloan as Albert Perry. Miss Johnson. Yes, Mr. Hamill. I was just leaving for the day. Shall I bring the mail in? No, leave it on your desk. Before you go, will you do something for me? Yes, Mr. Hamill. Phone the theater and ask Blaine to come over here and see me after rehearsal. I will wait for him. Yes, Mr. Hamill. Anything else? No. Good night, Miss Johnson. Good night, sir. It was over. The most difficult performance of my career... I had played the part of Lee Hamill, theatrical producer, with Lee's body lying not 15 feet away. I suppose I'd had better roles, more artistic ones, that is, but never a tougher one. This one had lasted five and a half hours, and my life hanging on every minute of it. Looking back, I can see now how inevitable that performance was from that night two weeks before when I waited for Elspeth at Luigi's. Hey, Mr. Perry, you ordered dinner now? No, not yet, Luigi. I'm still waiting for my wife. She's late for some reason. Yes, I can see. You wait for two hours. And look what you do to the tablecloth, Mr. Perry. Writing all over it like that. That's not nice. The laundry, she complain, is hard to get out. <laughs> I'm sorry, Luigi. Uh, bring me a glass of Chianti, will you? Yes, Mr. Perry. Glass of Chianti. Oh, Albert, I'm sorry I'm late. My poor star, darling. Well, finally. I've kept you waiting. Have you ordered yet? Just a glass of wine. One glass? Luigi, bring a whole bottle. We're celebrating, darling. Celebrating what? Your arrival? I got the part. What do you think of that, my sweet? Isn't it wonderful? Oh, sure. That's great news. But why did it take this long? Oh, well, you know how Lee Hamill likes to talk. And then after he decided to give me the part, he had to go into a long discourse on how to interpret the role. I'd have called if I could, but I just couldn't interrupt him. And when I finally did break away, I didn't want to lose a minute. The Chianti, Mr. Perry. Chianti? It should be champagne. Well, you know as well as I do, we can't even afford this. Oh, but we can. I'll be getting 500 a week. Think of that. And, oh, darling, I didn't tell you. I think there's a part for you, the part of Tony. He's just your type. When I see Lee tomorrow, I'll talk to him about it. No, save your breath. I saw him last week. You, you did? You didn't tell me. Well, there was nothing to tell. But what did he say? He said there was nothing for me in the play. Nothing. Oh, but that was last week, darling. Now he may feel different, especially if I ask him. If you ask him. <laughs> I'll turn on the fatal charm. Why, you'll do nothing of the kind, not with that wolf. Silly, I'm kidding. But you just leave it to me, darling. We'll be a husband and wife team yet. <gasps> I can see it now. Night Cafe, a Lee Hamill production starring... Albert and Elizabeth Perry. Uh, 
Albert. Well, look at you. What's the occasion? I'm going downtown to meet Lee. Well, what for? Rehearsals aren't starting already, are they? No, but he wants to discuss the play with me. And that gives me just the opportunity I want. You know, to ask him about you. Look, baby, I just assume you didn't. Any favor Hamill does for anyone has to be paid for. Uh, what time will you be home? Oh, I don't know. But if I'm late, you just go right ahead and eat. Don't wait for me. Well, okay. Oh, the script. I left it here on the desk. Oh, I was looking it over. Here it is. Oh, thanks. You know, I guess I could handle that Tony role, all right? Oh, I know you can, darling. Oh, Albert. Now, what is it? Look what you've done to this script. Why do you have to scribble on things? Well, if I didn't do that, I'd probably bite my nails. Just nervousness. (laughs) Goodbye, my pet. And don't worry, the part's as good as yours. And Hamill won't eat me, you know. (laughs) Not unless I let him. Bye, darling. Well, every day the following week, she went down to see Lee to discuss interpretation, she said. We'd meet at Luigi's every night at six. She'd come in bubbling over with excitement and always with the assurance that she was on the point of landing the role for me. But Thursday morning, I found an item in Variety. I handed the paper to her to read. Lee Hamill signs Matt Blaine for a featured role in Night Cafe opposite... Elsbeth Perry. So you're still working on Lee to give me the part, are you? Oh, but darling, I knew about Matt Blaine. As a matter of fact, Lee signed him on Monday. And today is Thursday. Why didn't you tell me Monday that Blaine had the part? Because on Monday, I didn't want to make you feel bad. And after what happened Tuesday, I wasn't so sure you couldn't still have the part. All right, what happened Tuesday? Well, we were all in Lee's outer office waiting for Lee to call us in. Well, you know how Blaine is... Always doing takeoffs on people to prove what a good mimic he is. Uh, he thinks he's good. Well, this time he decided he'd give an imitation of Lee interpreting roles for us. <clears throat> now, my dears, pay close attention. The script <laughs> calls. No, let me do it. Here's the way <laughs> Lee sounds. <clears throat> Now, my dears, my darlings, this wonderful script demands stark realism. Life in the raw is stripping down to essentials. (laughs) Oh, that's lead of the light, Albert. Well, Blaine did it fairly well, too. He was going great guns when Lee opened the door of his private office and stood there taking it all in sore as a boil. Rough break for Blaine. (laughs) Lee didn't speak to him all that day. Blaine is so unnerved that I'm sure he'll mangle his part. Oh, I see. So now I'm supposed to sit around and pray that Blaine gets the sack. Oh, don't feel that way about it. He's just not right for the part anyway. So keep your chin up, sweet. All right. What about dinner tonight? Oh. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Lee asked me to have dinner with him. Well, you're not going to, are you? Oh, I never would, only... He's asked the cast up to his apartment after dinner for the first reading. And and since I'll be in the city anyway, I, I thought it might be just as well to accept his invitation. All right. Well, I'll go along downtown with you. I'll eat at the Lambs and pick you up after your reading. Oh, but, Albert, I I don't know how soon we'll finish. All right, so I won't pick you up. At least you don't mind my coming downtown with you. Oh, not at all. But hurry and dress. I don't want to be late. I'd had dinner at the Lambs Club and was knocking some balls around in the billiard room when I saw Matt Blaine. Hi, Albert. Oh, hello, Matt. What are you doing here? Oh, same thing you are, wasting time. Want a game? Well, don't you have a reading tonight at Lee Hamill's? Reading? Oh, no. We don't begin until Friday. First rehearsal. Well, rack them up. Let's go. The next day, I didn't mention to Elspeth my meeting Blaine at the Lambs. But when she told me she was going to visit her mother that night, I simply said I'd go along. But, Albert, why spoil your evening? You know you and Mother never get along. All right, if that's the way you want it. Why, Why don't you go to a movie or something? That's an idea. You'll have a much better time there than at Mother's. (laughs) And so will I. I got my hat and left, but instead of going to the movies, I waited in the shadows near the subway entrance. When Elspeth came out, I followed her into the subway, unseen. She got off at 59th Street, and the sense of shame I had at following her was replaced by a feeling of rage and frustration. 
when she went into Lee Hamill's hotel on Central Park South. I waited outside the hotel until midnight. And when she didn't come out, I left. At that moment, I felt I could kill Lee Hamill. This is Jeffrey Barnes again in just a moment, Act Two. But first, here's Dan Seymour with an important announcement. Friends, here's your chance to get that luxurious vacation trip you and your family have been waiting for all expenses paid. That's right. A $3,500 vacation trip or cash is the grand prize in Mole's fascinating contest, My Closest Shave. And there are 106 other prizes. Five new Ford sedans... Ten of Emerson's latest table model television sets installed or radio phonographs, and also 75 cash prizes totaling $5,000. Now, that's $25,000 worth of prizes in all. Well, tell us more, Danny. How do you enter the contest? Well, it's easy, it's fun. Get the printed rules and suggestions from your druggist. Then write the story of your closest shave, your narrowest escape from danger, embarrassment, or failure, your most exciting experience of any kind. The story, not the writing, is what counts. Send your entry with two end flaps bearing the name Mole from any Mole carton. Mail to Mole, Post Office Box 49, New York 8, New York. Now that's Mole, Box 49, New York 8, New York. The whole family can get in this grand contest. Send as many entries as you wish, but include two Mole end flaps from the carton with each entry. Remember, 107 prizes worth $25,000, including trade prizes, are waiting to be won. So get your close shave entry in soon. This is Jeffrey Barnes again, returning you to the Mystery Theater and Act Two of Solo Performance, starring Everett Sloan as Albert Perry. What would you like for breakfast, dear? Just coffee. You came in pretty late last night. Oh, you know how Mother is. She kept me at gin rummy till past midnight. Elspeth, that movie last night started wheels turning in my brain. I got an idea. An idea? Why don't we go out to Hollywood and have a try at pictures? You seem to forget I have a contract and a darn good one. You seem to forget I have no darn good contract. I've made up my mind, Elspeth. We're going. Albert, I can't break my contract with Lee. Oh, the devil with Lee. This part will make me, Albert. It's practically a starring role. Lee means more to you than I do, doesn't he? He wa... Oh, now I begin to see. You're not crazy. You're only jealous. I'm not jealous. Oh, yes, you are. Well, believe it or not, I'm relieved. That's a normal reaction anyway. After all, I guess I have been spending quite a bit of time with Lee. But just let me assure you, dear... You don't have to bother. Albert, wait. Wait, we begin rehearsals on Friday. Blaine will be fired then, I'm sure of it. Lee didn't exactly promise me, but you're almost certain to get the part. Won't you wait until Friday, dear? All right. I'll wait until Friday. Friday afternoon, I went downtown and waited outside the theater... At one, the cast began to leave by the stage door. Then Lee and Elspeth came out together and hopped into Lee's car. I knew where they were going. (laughs) Elspeth said very little to me that weekend. Maybe she knew I wouldn't take any more of that line about trying to get me Blaine's part. Monday's rehearsal was called for 2.30. I figured Lee Hamill would be in his office all morning preparing for it. At 11.30, I entered his reception room. Oh, good morning, Mr. Perry. Good morning, Miss Johnson. Uh, will you tell Mr. Hamill I'd like to see him? Oh, of course. Sit down, won't you? Elsbeth Perry's husband is here. Yes, sir, I... Yes, Mr. Hamill. I'm sorry, Mr. Perry, but he's just too busy to speak to anyone. He's not casting, you know. But this is important. It's something personal. I'm really sorry, Mr. Perry, but you can't see Mr. Hamill today. Oh. Okay, I, uh... I'll drop in again tomorrow, Miss Johnson. Do that, Mr. Perry. But I didn't take the elevator down. 
Instead, I slipped into an alcove at one end of the corridor. It was close to 12, and I knew the girl would soon be going to lunch. At about 10 to 12, I heard the door open and the girl's footsteps going off toward the ladies' room. I walked quickly back to Hamill's office, crossed the reception room, and entered his private office. Yes? Oh, it's you, Perry. <coughs> Miss Johnson told you I was busy, did she not? She did. But you're going to listen to me whether you can spare a moment of your precious time or not. Before you begin, Mr. Perry, please understand, I have no work for you. I know that. Then we have nothing to say to each other. I ask you to leave my office. I'm not leaving. Mr. Perry, merely because I have engaged your wife to act in my play is no excuse for you to force yourself on me when I have no time for you. You've got plenty of time for my wife, haven't you? Now listen to me, Hamill. No louse of a producer is going to live to brag that he walked off with my wife, see? Oh, this is too much. Get out of my office. Take your hands off me, Hamill. I warn you. Get out! Get out or I will brain you! Hysterical fool picked up a paperweight and came at me. I grappled with him, and then suddenly the hatred I felt for him swept over me in a blind rage. My groping right hand seized an object on his desk, and I plunged my fist into his chest. Ha! Oh, oh, oh. He was on the floor, dead. And in my hand, I held a silver letter open, a dripping blood. I dropped it and made for the door. I had to get out before the girl came back. But... Just as my hand gripped the knob, I heard the outer door open. I was trapped. And then... The inter-office phone. If it wasn't answered, she'd come in here. Acting almost on reflex, I walked over and picked it up. Hello? Mr. Hamill? <laughs> Mr. Hamill? Yes? I'm ordering a, a sandwich for lunch, Mr. Hamill. Shall I order something for you? No, uh, no, thank you, Miss Johnson. Very well, Mr. Hem. I'd carried it off. Now she'd have a lunch in the office and then go out to shop, probably. All I had to do was wait. My eye fell on the body. Quietly, I pulled it to the closet and pushed it in. And then I wiped the handle of the letter opener and threw that into the closet, too. The telephone, the doorknob, and the key. I had to get my fingerprints off them. My handkerchief did it quickly. I pulled on my gloves. I'd take no further chances of leaving a print behind. Half an hour to wait and to think things over in comfort. I sat down at Lee's desk and lit a cigarette. The clock had ticked away the minutes. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, when... Yes? Mr. Van Dyke is on the phone. I cannot talk to him now. But he says he must discuss a very important problem of direction. Very well. Uh, put him on. Hello, Lee. What about that first entrance of the girl? What have you decided about it? Oh, yes, yes, the entrance. Uh, I leave it all to you. You are the director. Do it however you think best. But you said yesterday... Yes, I was wrong. You are right. What? Yes, yes. Just as you said it should be. You say so. Only after what you told me yesterday, I hardly... A man I... can change his mind, no? I, I have thought it over. You are right and I am wrong. That is all. Okay, Lee. For the next two hours, nothing happened. And then... I was startled by the ringing of the phone. I realized it was a call on Lee's private wire. Hello, Lee. Elspeth. Elspeth. Now I really began to sweat. Could I possibly fool my own wife? Especially since she had already heard my impersonation of Lee. Hello? Hello? Lee? Yes, Elspeth, darling. Van just told us you wouldn't be here at rehearsal, and I just had to speak to her. What is it, my dear? You know. Uh, what, uh, what would you like me to say? Just three little words. What? Lee, dear, I just can't continue without knowing. Oh, so uh, you want an answer? Yes, please. Uh, let me hear you say them first, those three little words you want. He has it. He has it? Yes, the job, the part of Tony. Oh, oh. Please, Lee, it means so much to me. 
And Albert would be so much better than Blaine, you know that. Is this why you have been so nice to me? Don't be angry, Lee. You know how I feel about Albert. But if he doesn't get the job, he's going to the coast. So? And if he does, I'm going with him. And break your contract? I have no alternative. Well, in that case, I have no alternative, my dear. The job is his. Oh, you darling. Thanks a million. I'll phone him right away. Uh, why not wait and tell him personally tonight? <laughs> the pleasure would uh, perhaps be greater. How oh, perfectly right I will wait. Oh, thanks again, darling. How does a fellow feel who has just discovered that the wife he suspected was never anything but loyal to him? That the man he has just murdered in a jealous rage was never anything more to her than a business acquaintance? I'll tell you how he feels. It may surprise you by its very simplicity. He wants to escape the consequences of his crime. Yes, that's all. He just wants to escape. This is Jeffrey Barnes again. In just a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of solo performance. Now, a word from George Putnam. Thousands of dandruff sufferers who've been ready to give up in despair after trying other methods without success have found that double dandrine gives them real relief. You see, outstanding authorities point out that a germ, Pity Ross Poromo Valley, is the cause of the most common kind of dandruff. Methods that simply wash away loose dandruff are ineffective because they don't destroy this germ. For real relief, it must be destroyed. And double dandrine does that. It actually kills this germ on contact. Even in many severe cases, double dandrine has given remarkable results. Now, the reason for double dandrine's amazing efficiency is a special ingredient, an active antiseptic that's used by many hospitals because of its astonishing effectiveness. In double dandrine, we call it Alzan. So try double dandrine and see if you don't agree that it really does more than many dandruff-fighting methods Methods that actually are no better than plain water. Get double dandrine tomorrow. Your money back if not satisfied. At last it was 5.30 and the secretary left. Ten minutes later I walked down the stairs unseen, mingled with the crowds leaving the building and took the subway. In 40 minutes I was home. And now the clincher... Still impersonating Lee Hamill and pretending to be at the office, I phoned Van Dyke at the theater and told him I was dismissing Blaine from the cast. My alibi was complete. Since Elspeth had dutifully reported to me that I was to replace Blaine in the cast of Night Cafe, I attended the rehearsal the next day. I wasn't very surprised when the police walked in, but the rest of the cast were electrified. Quiet, please. Quiet. Quiet, please. Mr. Hamill was murdered. Oh, my God. Just one minute, please. Was murdered sometime between 6.20 last night at midnight. He was alive at 6.20, according to his director, who spoke to him on the phone. Now... I want you all to understand that none of you is under suspicion. But I am asking you to come down to headquarters with me so we can uh, round up some facts. At headquarters, we found Blaine, looking like a ghost. He'd been questioned already, and he showed it. We were all separated and put into individual rooms. I sat down at an old battered desk and had myself a cigarette. There was a pad of yellow ruled paper and a pen and inkwell there. <laughs> it made me smile. If I had wanted to write my confession, all I had to do was pick up the pen and start. All afternoon, the questioning went on while I waited alone in the room. I ran out of cigarettes at about seven and they wouldn't let me send for any. Finally, at ten, Loman opened my door and came in. You're Perry, aren't you? Yes? No, no, don't get up. Just stay where you are. I'll use the corner of the desk. Uh, I understand you were up to see Hamill yesterday morning. 
Yes, I'd heard there might be a chance for me to take Blaine's place in the play, so I went to speak to Mr. Hamill about it. And he wouldn't see him? Well, his secretary said he was busy. He told you there was no casting, didn't he? No, he didn't tell me anything. Miss Johnson told me, but not Mr. Hamill himself. What made you think he'd give you Blaine's place? My wife told me there was that possibility. And as a matter of fact, when she called him later that afternoon, he did tell her that I had the part. It was sort of tough on Blaine, wasn't it? Well, you know how those things are. Fortunes of war. I suppose Blaine was plenty sore about it. Uh, sore at Hamble, I mean. Yes, I suppose. Uh, does he have an alibi for last night? Suppose you leave the questions to me, Perry. What about your own alibi? <laughs> That's easy. From about uh, 6.30 to 8, I was at Luigi's, a little Italian restaurant uptown. You can check with Luigi. After that, my wife can alibi me, if you'll accept her word. And before 6.30? Well, does that matter? If Hamill was alive until 6.20... Van Dyke swears he was. He talked to him on the phone, but somehow our medical examiner has other ideas. He thinks Hamill was killed earlier in the afternoon. But how could that be? Where uh, were you yesterday afternoon? Why, home. Any witnesses? No, do I need any? Tell me, Perry, when you came to see Hamill yesterday morning, did you go into Hamill's private office at all? No, the girl must have told you. And you weren't in that private office at any time during the afternoon? I was not. I was at home. I give you my word. Uh, mind if I take that pad on the desk? Certainly not. You do this? What? Oh, oh, yes. It's a bad habit of mine. I scrawl cats all over everything. Bad habit is right, Perry. So bad, it's going to send you to the chair. What do you mean? We found cats just like these doodled on Hamill's blotter pad. But my, my wife spoke to Hamill. Van Dyke spoke to him later in the afternoon. He was alive. You're an actor, Perry. You tell me you're pretty good at imitations. Must have been hard at it all afternoon on the phone and uh, between times scrawled cats all over the nice clean blotter. That's why we kept all you folks waiting in separate rooms. A new parlor game we thought of. We call it Find the Doodler. It did an actor's heart good to hear them at the trial. Right down the line, Elspeth Van Dyke and Hamill's secretary, each one swore it was Hamill's voice and not mine that came through the telephone that afternoon. Yes, their testimony added up to a rave notice from George Jean Nathan. I'd have gone free, too if it hadn't been for the cats. But then, there's always an if, isn't there? This is Jeffrey Barnes again, inviting you to be with us next week when our star will be the glamorous stage and screen actress Virginia Gilmore who is currently appearing in the motion picture close-up. Miss Gilmore will play the leading role in a story by Paul Monash entitled Deadly Nuisance. The original music for the Mole Mystery Theater is composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. Everett Sloan was starred and Elizabeth Morgan featured in tonight's performance. Any resemblance between the names and characters used on this show and any actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. And now this is Dan Seymour saying good night until next week at this same time when the Mystery Theater presents Deadly Nuisance, starring Virginia Gilmore. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.